The Raging Tajin keeps raging. Another hat trick in DC. A superstar battle. And it comes out in the Sabres' favor. We will recap Sabres and Capitals. Look at a potential scoring race and an update on the playoff race. All ahead here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast. Your Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. The Sabres back in the win column after a six-game win streak that ended in Ottawa. They are back in their winning ways with a 5-4 win in D.C. over the Washington Capitals. We will look at the playoff race. We will look through my notes from the game, including Uka Pekalukinen's performance. Uh, surprisingly strong uh, goal, or I should say a good goal that the Sabres needed from an unexpected place and a superstar on the other side of the ice and Alex Ovechkin scoring a couple of goals. I always love talking about his chase of Wayne Gretzky's record. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but of course we got to start today's show with a look at Tage Thompson. So that is all ahead here on the lockdown Sabres podcast at sneaky Joe sports to follow me on Twitter at lockdown Sabres. If you want to, send a tweet in that'll get on the show or you can do that on our youtube channel as well a superstar battle thompson v ovechkin yes two superstars it is still amazing that Tage thompson is even in the same breath of some of the guys that he is competing with statistically um but he is and he is in a scoring race right now we'll look at that race but this was a game where he carried the Buffalo Sabres. They score five goals. He is in on four of them. Three goals and an assist. And I might hazard to say, Thompson's assist in this game was the greatest play of the game. It was his best play of the game. Speed on display. So many things with Thompson are always just amazing to watch. His shot, the release that he has, the finish on his goal-scoring ability, his hands, his size, there's just so much on display. Very rarely do we point to his speed as something that contributes to him being a star player in the league right now. But that first play, that assist that he creates to get Alex Tuck open on the other side and give him a goal-scoring opportunity, which Tuck buried in the back of the net, that is Thompson getting on his horse, seeing that the defenseman is caught flat-footed, and he is flying into the capital zone. I mean, he is moving at a million miles per hour. And then not only does he have the speed and those long strides to beat the other capital to the puck, but then he has got the skating ability to slam on the brakes, spin around in one motion and get the puck over to Alex Tuck, who was wide open back door. That is speed. And that is skating that is on display for Tage Thompson. And again, it is not something that gets mentioned too often. That's a, a key part of his game. But he's one of the best skaters on the Sabres. And again, he's so good at other things that we forget to mention it. But that play, that was certainly on display. The hands were on display too. He had to do that little toe drag move, spin around, get that puck over to Tuck. Um, but that first assist was incredible. And then the three goals are all shooting, right? The power play goal is just a wicked clapper from the wall that he puts in the back of the net that I'm sure was 100 miles per hour. I didn't see it clocked on the broadcast, but I'm sure it was 100 miles per hour. Um, and then you had two wrist shots. The second goal that Thompson scores, that is impressive in that it's the puck is caught in his feet a little bit. It's a great effort by Alex Tuck. Um, this, by the way, if we go back in the, in the game cast a little bit here, uh, this is the goal that makes it... Uh, three to one in favor of the Sabres. Um, and the puck, after a great effort by Tuck to dig it out, he, he's got a defenseman on his back. He gets it to Thompson, but it's in Thompson's skates. In fact, it's, it's on, excuse me, it's on his left skate, and he is able to keep it and pu almost push the puck forward. This isn't like a typical get all your weight on the shot. He's almost pushing it forward using a lot of uh, torque with his wrists. And it's like it's top corner 
and maybe it's 80 miles per hour. Like he gets so much on this, this wrist shot that you cannot believe it. If someone had played hockey, I watched that and think, how did he get that much on his shot? It wasn't even in the wheelhouse. He had to kind of dig it out of his feet, but he did. And then the third goal by Tuck, the winner in overtime, uh, which is the first hat trick goal to in overtime for the Sabres since Thomas Vanek in 2008. That is again, another, again, another great effort by Alex Tuck to dig the puck out, keeps his stick along the boards to force a turnover, fights off the defenseman to get the puck over to Thompson. And that's just Thompson, quick little stick handle, little toe drag to change the angle on the goaltender and put it into the back of the net. Tons of skill on display from Tage Thompson. He now, after three goals against the Caps, is three goals behind Connor McDavid. Three goals behind Connor McDavid in the scoring race. He is plus 350 at our uh, friends over at Bet Online to win the Rocket Richard. And that will be one of two races we're going to be tracking all year. Of course, the Sabres are now in a playoff race for the first time in years. And two, the scoring title. It's it's really possible that he does it, uh, that he is able to track down McDavid. 29 goals in his last 29 games is part of the reason why I feel confident he's able to do that. He started slow. He only had one goal in his first seven, but 29 in his last 29 as Granado has stuck to uh, that Alex Tuck, Jeff Skinner line. As In the first couple of games, he was mixing things around, middle stat on that line. He was changing things up. Um, in this situation with Tuck and Skinner, all year and the fact that he's at a goal a game since the beginning of the season I think there's a real shot that he does it if you're wondering by the way about McDavid being he's plus 100 so 50 50 to win the scoring title and then everybody else the field is 50 percent with Thompson being the leader amongst the field he is second to McDavid um McDavid is interesting that he's even atop this list because if you think of Connor McDavid you don't think natural goal scorer. Now, you might think best player in the world, and I would think you would be correct uh, in saying that. In fact, I don't know that it's even that debatable. McKinnon has, at times has made that seem like it's debatable. Um, I, For me, it isn't. McDavid's the best player in the world, but you don't think natural goal scorer. Uh, his career high in goals is 44. But look at his assist totals. 79, 72, 63, 75, 67, 70. And yeah, he scored 30-plus goals every year going back to his rookie season. Um, but never 50, never approaching 60, which is generally where you got to be in the 50 to 60 range uh, to, to flirt with the Rocket Richard Trophy. This year, McDavid's already at 33 goals. He's already at 33 goals. And to do some quick math real quick, uh, McDavid is on pace for 70 goals. I think part of the reason that's happening is the Oilers don't have the same help around him that they have had in the past. Uh, so McDavid has had more of a responsibility on his shoulders to put the puck in the back of the net. And also he's at a career high shooting percentage of 21.9, uh, when his average is 15.6. That's another thing. I think it's possible we see some regression from McDavid, given that he is 7% above where he typically is shooting percentage-wise, whereas Thompson, Thompson's at 19%. He was at 15 last year, but we really don't know what Thompson's career arc is going to be for shooting percentage because this Tage Thompson, we've only seen for two years, and this Tage Thompson, I mean, this is, this is the first year of it, right? Like, he's ascended well beyond even where he was last year. And that really is where the amazement of Tage Thompson has, has been founded, is his, there's been levels of bewilderment with him. First, the first level was, oh, he's an NHL player. And if you rewind the clock a couple of years ago, we didn't think Thompson was going to be in the NHL. It was going that poorly where we thought Rochester don't even want him up here. He's like on, on the fourth line wing and no, thanks. No, no, I want no part of it. I'd rather have who Seth Griffith up here. Maybe. I don't know. Um, so stage one was last year, beginning of last year. And, oh, he could be in the NHL. He should be in the NHL. And stage two was, oh, he's a center. He's doing it from the center position. Okay, what uh, crazy. He didn't like he was a bad winger, but okay, we're gonna try him at center, and then it started working, and it's that's bewildering. The third stage of bewilderment was the goal scoring starting to show up. 38 goals last year, and suddenly 
yeah, the assist totals aren't all there, but suddenly he's a second line center. That's where I thought of him coming into this year. And at the end of last year, I thought this guy's going to be the Sabres second line center for a really long time. And again, comparing to the starting point, which is guys shouldn't even be in the NHL. That's crazy that he could be a second line center, not even the position you thought he was. Then stage four of bewilderment. I'm going to, there might be five here. Stage four is he's a first line center. He's a first line center. That, that was happening at the beginning of this year of this guy's going to be our number one center for a really long time. He's not a second line center. I don't need Matthew Savoy to show up and develop into a hundred point player uh, and become the playmaker because, Oh, Thompson's starting to develop as that playmaker stage five would be this guy's a star player, superstar player, right? He's a superstar player. That has been happening for two months, and it's still happening. I think there might be a stage six. Stage six, I think, is this guy's one of the best five hockey players in the world. And it's, I can't, I, I can't believe I'm, it's insane to say it, right? It is insane to say it. This guy played over 100 games in the NHL, and nobody wanted him in the league. No, we wanted him in Rochester. We we were sick of him. He was the punchline to the Ryan O'Reilly trade. He was the punchline. Not even he had surpassed O'Reilly winning the cup as the punchline. The, the the number one should have been, oh, the, your guy left and won the cup immediately and won the con Smythe. He was so bad, he transcended that. He was beyond that. How ridiculous it was that O'Reilly won the cup right away. And now I think you can make a serious argument. I, maybe I'm getting caught up in the moment, but I think you can make the argument he's a top five hockey player in the world. And what what can he do? What can't he do? He looks like Mario Lemieux out there with Ovechkin's shot. Find me find me a better comparison than that, by the way. You have he's so good, you have to combine all time greats to make the right comparison because Mario he, he, he was smaller than than Thompson was by a couple of inches. He didn't move quite the same as Thompson did, and. He wasn't just standing in the face-off circle ripping slap shots like that. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Mario Lemieux didn't have a great shot. He had 85 goals in a season. Um, he had a goal-scoring acumen, but also watch the goaltending back then. Uh, Thompson, he look at that that play last night in Washington with Ovechkin on the other side. That one-timer from the face-off circle. I'm, I mean, to combine that one-timer, 100-mile-per-hour one-timer with his size – his amazing hands, which I think are the best part of his game. I think right now his hands are the most dangerous part of his game. The speed that he has on display, the edge work that he has on display. What is Tage Thompson not good at offensively? I mean, defensive, we could we could have an argument. Offensively, what can he not do? If you were designing an offensive weapon in a lab, it would be Tage Thompson. Tell me it wouldn't. Six seven can skate with anybody, great edge work, an insane shot, and deeks that have him on highlight reels every other night. Design me the best offensive player in the NHL in a lab, and he's going to look like Tage Thompson. He's not as good as Connor McDavid, though, in me saying that. Don't let me get mistaken there. He's not as good as Connor McDavid. That's stage seven. Maybe we'll get to a stage seven someday. I don't think we ever will. I think McDavid's going to be the best player of all time by the end of this. Uh, just sneaking in a hot take here. But... Thompson. He's in stage five right now. And I think maybe we're approaching stage six, which is he's a top five player in the NHL. All right. We'll take a timeout. We'll continue to go over the Sabres and the Capitals from last night. I got a couple of thoughts on Uka Pekalukkanen, Alex Ovechkin, and also Casey Middlestat and Tyson Jost and their work from that game last night. And then at the end of the show, we'll go through the playoff standings, uh, the race, what happened around the Sabres in the Eastern conference on, uh, on, Tuesday night. That's all I had here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. We are, of course, always presented by betonline.net, your number one source for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. I'll be dropping in a couple of betting lines from Bet Online throughout today's episode. I did that earlier with uh, Tage Thompson being plus 350 for the Rocket Richard Award for the, uh, the scoring race. Thompson, by the way, also plus 2,500 at Bet Online to win the MVP, which McDavid is currently also favored for. Get the latest odds and trends for the NHL, including individual awards. Also, pro football, 
college bowl season, basketball, uh, soccer. They've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at betonline as well. They are the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information. Head to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online, where the game starts. Jody Biasi back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. Okay, I got a couple other thoughts from the Sabres 5-4 overtime win over the Washington Capitals. Uh, and I'm going to start with Uka Pekalukkanen in net. I, I think I want to qualify this as another strong performance from Lukanen, despite the fact that the stats were really not there. Lukanen allows four goals on 32 shots, 28 saves, and an 875 save percentage. That is not good. Those are not good stats, but he made huge saves at critical moments for the Sabres. Both were glove saves, the ones that I'm thinking of. Flashed the leather twice for massive saves, especially the one in the third period where the Sabres were on their heels. The Capitals had come back in the game, and Connor Sherry has the puck on the doorstep. Lukanen's out of position. He flies over, flashes the glove, and makes the save to keep that game uh, in reach for the Buffalo Sabres and not let it get out of hand there. So he made some big critical saves. I want to give him a quality start for that. I don't know that it's going to go down as that in the stats column, um, but those big saves. It wasn't perfect. Part of the reason why the stats didn't look good were his fault. You know, it wasn't just the Sabres blue line letting him down. He had a lot of problems with rebound control in this game against the Capitals. And that has always been a little bit of a problem in Lukanen's game. We know he's athletic. We know he can make big saves. We know he can track the puck well, but his rebound control has always been an inconsistency in his game, and that was happening against the Capitals. But again, big, massive saves at critical times. I, I'm going to give uh, a plus to, uh, to, to Lukanen on the night. Other things I notice in this game as I uh, go through my notes in our Explain Yourself segment, Middlestat and Jost, not my favorite combination. Anything with Middlestat at this point is not my favorite combination. Middlestat had a horrible turnover in the first period immediately after Tuck uh, gets the scoring started for the Sabres. Only a minute or two after the fact, there's Middlestat skating back to his blue line with Matias Samuelson coming down to jump into the play and middle stat turns it over, gets shoved to the ground and it's a breakaway going back the other direction. Um, and Sonny Milano is able to put it in the back of the net after middle stat loses a battle with Anthony Mantha. That is, it was a bad play, bad turnover by middle stat. He got his whole team caught out of position. He did make up for it in the third period. Still not a great game. Five on five uh, from what I saw. And I believe the numbers will bear that out. Yeah, expected goal. Jesus, the numbers will bail that bail, bear, bear that out. Middle stat, Jost and Olsen had an 11% expected goals for rate. I mean, holy cow, 11% is brutal. For comparison, Cousins, Quinn, and Paterka had 60% of the expected goals for uh, in this game when they were on the ice. But anyways, they had one great shift. And that contributed to the Sabres win. In the third period, they were buzzing. Middlestat was running around. He was flying on the forecheck, creating a turnover. Uh, and then he was getting a couple of opportunities himself. Jost was going to the net. He's got good speed. And Middlestat gets himself into a scoring opportunity and has a nice shot that maybe it's a little bit of a fortunate tip by Jost. His stick's in the right place at the right time. But they created their own luck on that play with just a real solid shift by Middlestead, Jost, and Olofsson. And Middlestead and Jost get in on the goal to tie that game in the third period. So they do deserve a shout-out for their goal in the third period, despite the fact that I do need to criticize Middlestead for that play in the first period because it was really bad. The other thing I want to get to from this game, Alex Ovechkin scores two goals. He's now at 808, 808 goals. And if there's any silver lining to the Sabres giving up some goals in this game, it is that I love the, the, the Alex Ovechkin is going to break this record and any goal he scores to get close, I'm fine with as long as the Sabres are going to win the game at the end. Uh, he's 86 behind Wayne Gretzky uh, for first all time. And cool moment with Ovechkin after he scores the second goal, uh, one timer from the slot after a turnover by Rasmus Dahlin, um and Matias Samuelson. They really both were in on the turnover. 
Ovechkin skates over to the boards and like high fives his son through the glass. That was really cool by Ovi. Um, both goals, by the way, are the Sabres should not be allowing these opportunities right off the face off. Thompson loses a draw in the first period and second period. And Ovechkin just snaps a wrist shot home. Skinner has got to travel around the, the, the other capital forward. He's not able to get there in time. Skinner's got to get there. Skinner's got to get there where Darlene's got to recognize that that puck's going right to Ovechkin and he's got to jump up, but Sabres can't allow him to get that opportunity on the goal that made it three to two. Uh, Capitals narrowing the goal, the gap to one. And then the goal in the third period, um, that's just, again, bat turnover by Samuelson and Darlene. That doesn't happen to them a lot, but it did happen there. And Ovechkin, you get to give him a one-timer from the slot. That's going in nine times out of ten. Um, so Ovechkin now at 808. And if you're wondering, like, at what point he'll catch uh, he'll catch Gretzky, he probably will catch Gretzky at the beginning of the 2025 season, if I'm doing my math right. No, 24. So if he gets through what he's on pace for now, you know, maybe he'll be about 60 goals away uh, next year. And at 38, listen, he's still scoring. He's third in the league behind uh, Thompson and McDavid. He could score 60 in a season still. I'm not saying he's not capable, but it's not likely. So if he gets to where he's on pace for right now this year, he'll be about 60 away, which means he'll probably go into not next year, but the following year, only needing a couple of goals. All right, when we take we come back, sail across the Atlantic, which really has become more about a sail across the Eastern Conference. Uh, Sabres are in fourth place in the division. And that's looking pretty good. But what happened around them? They're chasing down a couple of teams. The Islanders, the Capitals, can let you know where that is in the standings. The Panthers are, flirt, are uh, trying to catch them from behind. We'll let you know what happened around the Sabres in the Eastern Conference when we come back here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast with Joe DiBiase. Thanks for making Lockdown Sabres your first listen every day. When you're done with us, be sure to make Lockdown NHL Prospects your next listen, your daily podcast covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up all the way from now until the NHL draft, including uh, full coverage of the World Junior Championships, which is ongoing uh, today at time of listening or time of recording. Czech, Czechia and Sweden are just getting going, and then USA and uh, Canada later at 6.30. So check out Locked On NHL Prospects, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, let's take a sail across the Atlantic Division, and of course, uh, that will include the Eastern Conference as well, as we are uh, we are looking at a good rate down the stretch here in the and better and better. So, Looking at the standing, what happened on Tuesday night? The New York Islanders jumped back into a playoff spot. A 6-2 win over the lowly Vancouver Canucks who need to blow up their team, Toronto. The Islanders now at 46 points in 39 games for that eighth and final playoff spot. The second wild card position, 46 points in 39 games for them. That is Six points ahead of the Sabres. So the Sabres are six points out of a playoff spot, but they do have three games in hand on the New York Islanders. Um, big win for them. I believe, um, if I have this right, didn't somebody have a hat trick in that game? Uh, maybe not, actually. No, Matthew Barzell had a goal and two assists. Oh, I know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the Panthers game. Panthers beat the Arizona Coyotes 5-4, to four, and uh, Matthew Kachuk. Gets a hat trick in this one. Three goals and an assist. Eric Stahl, former Sabres. Gross as that is to say. 5-3 over the Arizona Coyotes. So, uh, as it stands today, the Panthers keep pace. They're only two points behind the Sabres, but the Sabres have played three fewer games than Florida. So they have three games in hand. That's looking down, looking up. Pittsburgh is now out of a playoff spot. Pittsburgh sits in between the Sabres and the Islanders. They have 44 points in 39 games played. Um, the Sabres have one game in hand on Pittsburgh, and that is all. Uh, so six points back of a playoff spot. They are eight points back of Washington with four games in hand as they gain a point on them last night. So uh, again, eight points back of Washington for the top wild card spot, six points back of the Islanders for the second wild card spot. Four games in hand on Washington, three games in hand on the Islanders. The Sabres, as it stands today, are on pace for 91 points. I would consider that a success. I mean, we want more. We're hoping for more. 
I would consider 91 points a success this season. That would mean being in the race almost to the very end. Um, and right now at Bet Online, the Sabres' odds to make the playoffs have risen to plus 300. So three to one to make the playoffs. Those are some pretty good odds. Wednesday night, if you're wondering, only a couple of games, nothing really with direct implications to the Sabres from what's above them. But the Devils, who are still way up there, second in the Metro, they have fallen off the face of the earth. They've won two of their last 10. It might actually be like two of their last 13. They're sitting with 49 points. That's nine above Buffalo, and they've only played one more game. They play tonight against the Red Wings. The Red Wings, one point behind the Sabres. They have a game in hand on Buffalo. Um, so they can actually pass the Sabres in the standings where they win tonight. But I'm not really all that worried about uh, Detroit. I think if Detroit is going to pass the Sabres, they're not making the playoffs anyway. And today, World Juniors. World Juniors. Again, uh, a 6.30 puck drop between USA and Canada. And we'll talk more about what we see from Yuri Kulik and Noah Oslin and Isaac Rosin uh, on our next show. So, that's going to do it for us. Thanks everybody for listening. Again, if you want more World Junior talk, head over to our uh, partner, uh, sister show, uh, Locked on NHL Podcast Prospects, uh, which is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks everybody for listening. And we'll talk to you next time here on the Locked on Podcast with Joe DiBiase.